and so we're alive. <laughs> Maria Carecla. Am I saying that right? Maria Carecla. Beautiful. That's so, good enough. Yes. That's good enough. How do you mm -hmm. say it? Maria Carecla. 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 All right. So we're, we're going to start in here in just a minute. And so just, you know, out of... When, whenever we do this, guys, it always feels like we're sitting, doesn't it, Marie? It feels like we're sitting in a box and talking into a box. <laughs> and so what we'd love for you guys is, is that if you're joining us right now, and regardless of your, if you're watching this live, please say hello and tell us, where are you watching from? You know, Maria's in, in Greece, in Cyprus. I am sitting in Sweden. So tell us, guys, like, where are you watching this from? And even if you are coming into this later on, just, you know, put in the comments. So we want to know, like, who we spoke to, right, Maria? And who was, you know, where you are sitting when you are watching this. And so I hope you can see as well and hear as well. We have puppies and, and, and you know, animals around oh. us <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> we're struggling a little bit with the with the internet signal at times, but you know we're we'll make this happen. So we have somebody from Canada and somebody from Sweden in Jönköping. Yeah, great that you're watching us. Uh, and so you know, just keep saying hello. And there's might be a little delay whenever you have a, a comment for us. It might show up just a little a bit later. From Finland and Israel, our amazing uh, hello from Italy. Maria, you are reaching, you know, out into the world today. <laughs> it's amazing. And there's one more from Sweden. Hey, Slavia. Amazing. So guys, this is Cocktails and Courageous Conversations, which is an inf if informal after work with two people who are passionate about something. This is where I invite somebody that I admire uh, to have a drink with me. And as we say, cocktails are optional. Courage is guaranteed. I'm saying this because I don't want emails about saying that we encourage drinking and that we are doing a drinking event. We just want to tell you that we go to an after work and we have a little chat and we hang out uh, and this is kind of the informal uh, tone of voice that we want to bring to this. We have Poland, we have UK, and we have Denmark. Yay! <laughs> Amazing. So, Maria Karekla, I was, I you know, uh, in 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 various platforms, I have been introducing you, uh, and you know, the list of your achievements is just. Like I just told you before we went on here, like you must be 97 years old and then I, you don't look like that <laughs> at all. Uh, and I'm just, I hope not. No, no, no. And I'm just, but I wanted to say that I'm so proud of you for everything that you have achieved. You were nominated Woman of the Year in Cyprus. You've done a TED Talk. Uh, you are the president-elect of the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. You're a fellow of the ACBS. You are prof prof associate. Pro you're a professor. You, uh, the, the list is so long, and so I'm just in. I'm just so honored that you are willing to come in here and talk to me. We have people also from Norway and from Romania joining. Look at the reach for this. People are here to see you, Dr. Karekla. So would you would you mind introducing yourselves? Tell tell us who you are. Thank you, Ricky. Um, putting a lot of stress on me that people all over the world are seeing us. Um, and who am I? <laughs> That that's that's a loaded question. Who am I? I'm I'm a lot of things. I'm uh, I'm a mother of two, um, and and a lot of animals go along with you know being a mother of eight birds right now and a dog and and so on. Uh, I'm an associate professor, as you said, at the university. So I'm a researcher. I'm a supervisor. Um, I'm a teacher, uh, I'm a clinician, I also work with clients and I love that part of my work. 
Um, so I'm, I'm a wife, uh, I am a daughter, I am a sister, I am a friend to hopefully a lot of people. And um, so I, I guess I'm a lot of things. <laughs> you are a lot of things. And one of the things that uh, so so I you you happen to live in one of my favorite places on this earth. And so I've been to Cyprus a few times and, and I found this like favorite place and that's where you live and actually we whenever i'm on holiday we get together don't we <laughs> yes and, and we missed you this year ricky yeah <laughs> yes this year we yeah. didn't go at all but I, as i told you like earlier next year we'll make sure to go twice uh because you know i just love cyprus and i love that you're there and i love the way so you know many people see you maybe within this context many people see you as you know mrs upcoming president and, and uh, fellow and and researcher and all of that hello there's the dog <laughs> and that's what we see and i also get to see like a very nice host and a fellow friend and somebody who, who's just so enormously welcoming and 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 heart warming in so many ways Thank so you. so maria um you are really like, can you tell us a little bit about the book that is going to be published uh, that you've already written and it's going to be out in a few months isn't it yes yes it's coming out in january i'm i'm really proud of this this has been something that um, i've wanted to do for a while um, my friend uh, and and close a colleague Megan Kelly who co-wrote this with me we've been talking about doing this for a long time since we were in grad school together and I'm so glad that we finally uh, were able to do it uh, it's a book on cravings and addictions so yeah we're having a cocktail tonight I, you even made me bring one and I don't usually drink quite a bit but I brought one just for the event today um, but uh, here we're talking about the difficulties people have with all sorts of cravings, whether it's food or, uh, you know, alcohol or drugs and so on. Um, so any form of difficulty in terms of cravings, um, the book can capture and hopefully it will reach people and help with these difficulties that we have. Um, and and the book is coming as i said out in in january and we're really excited about that uh, we titled the talk today uh, for the book craving but we also titled it craving life so because i wanted to go beyond just talking about the problematic cravings but that there's you know the the craving life and and craving what you want to do in life and what you want to achieve in life and where you want your life to go and I want to bring that emphasis in, in here as well. I love that craving life. I, I just love that title and I just love your approach to that. And so I know that, um, Maria, this is, this is quite personal to you. Uh, and uh, you've done a TED talk in Greek uh, about craving life and some of us don't understand Greek. <laughs> and so would, would you be willing to share uh, in here, uh, what, why I might say that this is personal for you. <laughs> yes, um, that's something that you and I have discussed a little bit, but many people may not, who didn't watch the TED Talk or couldn't understand it, um, have heard about my personal struggles with uh, with cancer um, on, on a number of levels. Um, and see, Ricky, I'm, I'm starting to water up. So <laughs> we come prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, in uh, this was uh, back in 2013. And as you said, I was doing a lot of things in my life. I was going up for promotion. You know, I had just moved to my new house. Um, you know, I had two babies. Uh, they were like healthy and nice and growing up my daughter had just gone to first grade you know everything in life seemed to be going so well and um, my mom had had a cancer breast cancer diagnosis two years earlier and in a visit I had to my gynecologist I said well my I'm not 40 yet when 
you know, you start having mammograms, but, you know, my mom has had this, you know, uh, struggle. So can I get a mammogram? And the doctor was originally, no, not needed until you're 40, you know, and I pressured him a little bit and he decided to give me a mammogram. And um, <sighs> so I go in there and uh, the, guy, the the radiologist there said, do you have like a, another mammogram from before? And I said, no. And I said, why? And he said, well, I see something, but I don't know if it's something or not. So this started a whole process of exploration and what it was, and uh, it was breast cancer. This was during Christmas from, you know, year 12, 12, sorry, 2012 to 2013. And he started a whole long process of getting diagnosed, getting, you know, biopsied, having to go through all that agony of what it was, was it something, was it not? Do I tell my mom who's just finished going through her struggle? You know, what do I do with my job? What do I do? I had just gotten a big grant. What do I do with this big grant? What do I do with my students? You know, and like lots of unknowns happening. You know, is this the end of my life? I'm not even 40 yet, you know, and will I live to see my kids grow up? And, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, then I, I had to have surgery and chemo and radiotherapy and I got a whole lot and it was a, a whole year of, of a lot of struggling um, and, and I think craving life and knowing about, you know, the, the treatment that we know about and, and all this background and knowledge I had helped me through this to be able to crave life and to overcome this problem and to be here today and to talk about it and you know and I still get scared and I still freak out whenever I hear the word or, or it's time to get the tests again and everything but you know I come back to okay you know it can happen to anyone a lot of people were asking me you know do you ever ask why me and I would say, why not me? Maybe, I mean, I was even working with cancer and still work with cancer. And I would say, you know, this can happen to anyone just because I work in this area doesn't mean I'm immune to this. And, you know, in a way, I even had some tools to go into this to be able to, you know, overcome this ordeal and, you know, hopefully then be able to give any knowledge I gain from this to others following. <sighs> oh my God, I'm just, oh, I'm so, like, I'm so honored and, and grateful that you're sharing this with us and people, regardless of you, if you're watching us live or afterwards, please put some love in the comments because Maria and I will go into the comments afterwards and we will read this. So please send all the love <laughs> uh, towards Maria uh, at this moment. So we're going to talk more about like crave, cravings and addiction and, and the work that you are doing there. We're going to talk about that in, in just a minute. But for now, Maria, what was that like? Like, what was that like for you to know all about ACT, acceptance and commitment the therapy? Know that, you know, acceptance and values and all of that, and then be in the middle of something that surely you do not want to accept. Yeah. Um, you're right about that. You don't want to accept, yet you want to, you, you know, you want life. So... I mean, it, it's interesting because even before then, I was giving the example, I think I stole that from Kelly Wilson, you know, when we were talking about values saying, you know, something like, you know, if I were to tell you that I would make you, you know, take this, you know, medication that would make you sick, would make you vomit, would make you, you know, not be able to move, tired, you know, would you take that? And most people will say, of course I wouldn't. But what if this would save your life and give you time to do all these other things that you value and you want in your life? And then people would say, yes, I would take it. And I mean, that's that's what chemo and, and treatment for cancer is like. So, I mean, I, I, 
when all that happened, this was coming back to my mind. And, you know, having this knowledge, I think, really helped me put it into practice for myself, but also it helped me figure out, okay, what are some things that we're telling people that are working? And what are some things that we're telling people that, you know, it's BS and it's not helping. And, you know, I was even thinking I had to do an MRI and going into the MRI, I was never scared of enclosed spaces. You know, I've, I've worked with clients before who, you know, had to have MRIs and were afraid and so on. But then going into one and you had to be there and closed and it lasted for one hour and you're like, oh my God, now I have to put everything I know into use. And you know what? Some things there you find out work and some don't work. And then, you know, it helped me then be able to bring a personal touch to the type of therapy I do and and to the discussions I have with my clients. Not that, you know, because it worked for me has to work for everyone else. No, not at all. It's just that, you know, I can understand the struggle from the other side as well. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I admire about you as a person, as a sister, as a uh, clinician, as a professor, as a teacher, that you have, there are so many things that you do, like, Marie, you are so authentic and you are so personal uh, and, and so you know all the scientific you know all the academic stuff you know that but you bring such personality with you in, in the things that you do and it's just very inspirational and you so you know this that I always like to talk about you know practicing what you preach when I when I teach I, I want to teach my students to do act rather than t talk about act or just present act I want them to embody it and and to model act and you're such a role model in this field because you will literally you will literally practice what you preach I'm sobbing over here <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised I'm not crying more Vicky. <laughs> oh, we did a little crying before we even started yeah. didn't we? Yeah. and so so Maria so uh, you wrote the book, you and, 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 uh, and is it Kelly? Megan. Megan Kelly. Megan Kelly. Yeah. Megan Kelly. That's why I remember the Kelly. So uh, you wrote this book that comes out uh, in, uh, in January. And just know that, you know, I will make sure to link to this. I have already linked to it. But when it comes out, we will remind people to go and get this book. Uh, the yeah. world needs this book. And so I'm... I know that many people watching here with us uh, are, you know, working with addictions and cravings. And so do you have, like, could you give, uh, and please folks who are list or with us now, you know, make sure if you have questions for, for Dr. Karekla, uh, put them in the comments. There might be a little delay, but we will check the comments and we will, you know, we want to connect with you. We want to answer your questions to the to the best of our ability and so uh so make sure to ask us questions or anything uh or in or and keep sharing the comments that means a lot to us because as i said before it feels like you were talking into a box and so we we want to connect and and you know feel like we're in the same bar waving at each other and hugging and all of that so maria um how do you like how i know this is a big question so feel free to to you know adapt it to you know whatever works for you but how would you say how does one work with act uh to, like what are what what are cravings and what are addictions like would you like what's yeah. your take and definition on that yeah um cravings we're talking about any sort of substance or um any sort of thing that anybody really wants and wants more of and has difficulty controlling. So um, we, we give a more formal definition in the book, but I'm trying to put it in, in lay language. Um, so uh, cravings is anything people um, have that they struggle with and don't want to um, have. And cravings usually are associated with thoughts and emotions that we may have as well. Now, addictions happen when we start using substances so as not to have this feeling, these thoughts related to 
craving. So, and, and as I said before, this can be, you know, in terms of food, um, in terms of like, you know, um, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, smoking. Um, it can be to the internet and that's like, you know, sex addiction. So it can, it can go for a lot of things. Um, in the book, we, we give specific examples and, and use stories from specific type of difficulties just to couch it more within the more traditional type of addiction scene. Um, so um, the ACT approach lends itself quite well to, to, this, um, uh, to these types of problems because um, as the ACT acronym says, ACT, um, accept, choose, and take action. And we use that because we have to make room for these cravings. They're part of, you know, uh, us. They're part of who we are. They're part of our brain and our body and, and, and our emotions. So we can't really get rid of them. And, you know, a lot of times trying to get rid of the cravings, we end up engaging in more addictive behaviors. So you drink to get rid of the craving. And then, you know, a few minutes later, the craving comes back and then you have to drink more and more and more. And this vicious cycle develops. So um, we talk about accepting, accepting not, you know, uh, passively, but accepting actively that, you know, this is part of the human experience of who we are as humans. It, they're going to happen. There's also a function as to why cravings uh, appear and why humans have the capacity to experience cravings and then move, you know, with compassion and um, into accepting um, and making room for them and then choosing to behave in accordance not to what a, our cravings dictate but as to what's important for us so moving from craving a substance to moving to craving life i i i, do, I love it <laughs> I, do, oh, I just love that moving from craving the, the, the substances to craving life I, isn't that beautiful? And there's there are so many things that I love about what you're saying. And one of the can I just highlight a few of them? One of the things that I hear you say that I think is so important, uh, Maria, uh, Dr. Karekla, is that uh, that the that acceptance is not a passive thing it's not like okay well then i'm just an addict then or then i just crave sugar and alcohol then like the, the, it has this pass passive tone to it and i love what you're saying it's like it's an active acceptance of this is what it's like to be human with that comes cravings and i can choose to have cravings and move towards the life that is important to me and i just think that you just nailed that so beautifully and it's just such an important like distinction or just important you know definition of acceptance and then another thing that you said that was just really struck my heart is to have compassion like to have compassion for like even for the craving right like have compassion for the for life and the cravings that are a part of life definitely and and for ourselves because with with a lot of addictive behaviors goes a lot of stigma from others from ourselves as well and a lot of um um, oh my God, I'm losing my English with all the emotion that we brought up. So I'll start talking in Greek soon, Ricky. Um, we so, will Google so Translate. I, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of shame. That's the word I was looking for. Shame, yes. So, um, and, and this is what we, we, wanna, uh, we wanted to, to bring up in this book as well, that we need to approach even the self-stigma that we put on on us and the shame we may be feeling and, and make room for that as well and see that, okay, maybe we've made mistakes in the past. Maybe we've, you know, fallen into this sort of trap or this vicious cycle. And, you know, now we're here again and now we're learning, you know, new tools, new skills, and now we can choose to behave in a different way. And, you know, allowing 
our experiences to be there and still choosing to move forward. I love this like notion of allowing and then the now. Like so I I might I might have had a setback today uh, and I can choose to, you know, I don't know if you have this saying, get back on the horse. I don't know if that is, uh, you know, I can choose to uh, to put my feet down right now in the direction of what is important to me, regardless if I just slipped uh, 10 minutes ago. Yes, exactly. And and uh, within the book, we, we brought, um, it, it's something that, you know, I was using from like a Greek me mythology and stories in, in my work, I, I use a lot of like cultural adaptations of metaphors and stuff. And, and because I work in the Greek context text, I use Greek mythology quite a bit. So for a long time, I've been using like metaphors from like Greek mythology and Hercules, for example, yeah. who um, Hercules found himself at some point um, in front of a path, a, a, like a split path. And he had to choose which path to follow. And within this metaphor, he's, he struggles to figure out which way. And there's two goddesses there that, you know, promise. One of them is tantalizing and beautiful. And um, we call her Kagia, which means the mean one in a way. But um, she kind of like was trying to persuade him to go her way. And, you know, there he would have like, the, the life he would have the parties and the drinking and you know anything he wanted all the food and you know he would have a good life and then a, a good life in terms of like these kinds of things and then on the other side was a beautiful lady more solemnly dressed um her name was Aredi, which it's uh, the name means virtue and um she said well i cannot promise all these you know things that you know, Gaia promised to you, but I can tell you that if you follow this path, it may not always be easy. There's going to be obstacles, there's going to be pitfalls, there's going to be difficulties along the way. But if you follow my road, you will come, you will um, help people, you will, you know, stand for something, and maybe you'll become a hero in the process. You may save your country, you may help your fellow um uh countrymen and women and um you know m maybe you'll become a hero well we talk about hercules today so we can figure which road he chose he obviously chose the virtues road and the more difficult path um to life but i use that to say that at each moment we we are at such crossroads and we have a, a choice to make and then Raz Harris came up with the choice point and I was like oh my god this is exactly what I was talking about and he put it into words and um, with also Raz's permission and what we've been doing we've been calling it now in this book a choice moment mm -hmm. so each moment is a choice moment that we can you know have a choice on which path we're going to choose to follow and um, at each moment, even if we chose a different path before, we can now choose a new path that hopefully will take us towards what we value. Uh, Marie, I'm just like, you should, I, I'm secret, sometimes you'll, not secretly, sometimes you'll see me look away a little bit. It's because I'm watching like there's hearts and love, oh. you know, flooding over you i know that you're not seeing it right now because you're so busy doing this i just wanted to tell you that there is so much love coming your way right now and people are so amazed by you know what you've shared and can i just say that this this metaphor is so so beautiful um and it's i think it's so important like regardless of what we how we teach it regardless of who came up with what i think there's something very wise in seeing that in every moment we have a choice as to how how we behave um and that i love your whole idea the way that you and your colleague in this book are talking about doing things with cravings like not waiting for them to pass or waiting for them to go away and as as long as 
as long as the cravings are having us, <laughs> we're kind of doomed to be living a life of addiction. But if we can live with our cravings, like we have our cravings, there's something precious inside of that. Yes. It's just amazing. Definitely. Maria, Thank so I, I, I happen Thank to know that your mom might be in here today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, and, and, I, and I know that she might not, uh, you know, she's more confident in Greek. <laughs> but <laughs> but as a little perspective exercise, as she's watching you now, what do you think that she's feeling like here here you are in front of literally the world, <laughs> giving us metaphors, you're writing books, you are our upcoming president, you will lead the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. You're doing TED Talks. Yeah, like I, I can see that so many people will look up to you and go, I, I want to be Maria. And so you're such a role model to humans in general, and I think to many women in particular. Um, and so mom is here. <laughs> and <laughs> you will have to translate this to her afterwards. But what do you think that she would be feeling as she sees you now? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure she's proud. For whatever she understands from all this, it's really funny because when I went to to, to do the TED Talk, I had to go to um, Crete to do it. I was invited to go there. And I, I actually have a picture of my mom in my TED Talk saying the voices that I hear that come from what she was telling me and you know how I was feeling that I'm, maybe I'm a bad mother because I had to travel and leave my kids behind to, to travel. So when I said I was going to give this TED talk, my mom had no clue what this was or, you know, how big this is or important. So it's interesting that a lot of times she doesn't understand or, you know, I became president of this and she's like, what, what thing did you become president of? You know, what is this? You know, she, she couldn't understand the, you know, that this is a worldwide association with so many members. And it's, it's a big thing for me that I was able to, to get this, uh, but she's always proud. And, and I know she's supportive and, you know, for whatever she understands from all this, she's definitely always been there and always supported me through it. And so the reason why I'm asking this is because, you know, I, you know, I know, you know, from what I, from the little things that you told me about mom, I'm guessing that this is what she would look at you with the most compassionate and proud eyes. Oh, yeah. And so one of the things that you and I have talked about, like off camera, is this uh, mm -hmm. the thing that we, you know, when we look at ourselves and we go, oh, I'm nothing special. And, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm a fraud or I'm not smart enough or that person is much smarter and, and all of that. So, so, and I've asked your permission to ask really personal questions. <laughs> so what, like, what do you, like, when you, when we read that summary of the things that you have done and that you do, what are you telling yourself? Like, are you beating yourself up? Ever? <laughs> yes, lots of times. I mean, I, I do feel proud and for, for the things I've done. And sometimes I don't really appreciate them until I hear them from, you know, being told by somebody else. And I was like, really, I'm, I'm now the president elect. How did this happen? But even when I was running and, and I remember the day I, I saw the announcement, I, I knew that my name w had been proposed and I agreed to to have my name be put there. And then I, I get the ballot and I see my name go against Emily Santos, a person I admire so much that I, you know, is somebody I look up to, I think so highly of her. And I'm like, what? I mean, I'm nothing like Emily, you know, I cannot, you know, first of all, I, I cannot win this. And second of all, I, I cannot go up against a friend, against somebody I admire. You know, I have nothing compared to Emily. And I struggled through the whole time. And people were telling me, you have to, you know, um, put yourself out there. You have to campaign. You have to let people know you're running. Otherwise, there's no point in you you know, having put your name there. And I hate being on the spotlight. I told you that before. And, um, you know, that's something that makes me really anxious and nervous to be on the spotlight. And, you know, I, it was so hard for me to campaign and I did it. And I had a, 
help I'm, I'm sure from a lot of friends and, and colleagues and you know especially from Stephen Hayes I had so much support and I couldn't believe that Steve was supporting me you know and um, you know this big name I've always through my career looked up to and you know I'm like what is he seeing in me that he's supporting me so all these thoughts and doubt and you know always feeling like the imposter and you know and even now, like I go into the, the meetings and I'm like, okay, do I have anything to say? Why, why did I become president? Do I, you know, do I really, can I really do something for this association? And what can I really do? So, yeah, self-doubt is always there. <laughs> And, you know, not only president, you do TED Talks, you're a professor, uh, you are nominated, you were nominated Woman of the Year, you you, you write books. And the, reason, <laughs> and, but the reason why I'm bringing this uh, into our discussion is that, as I said, I think that so many people are looking up to you. And then I see, like, like for instance, just inside of this little group where we are right now, I know some people might watch this later in another space and I see people in this group going oh I'm, you know I'm nothing special or I don't have something to offer or I'm not a doctor or I'm not a psychologist or I'm not this and I'm not that and it's just so interesting that it's like we're never like you you literally have all of the you know like you have most titles uh, in uh, uh, that you know that many people would aspire to have and still we're beating ourselves up isn't that yes. just amazing? And I'm just so, I'm, I'm just so grateful that you're willing to share this because strong women or strong humans uh, do not, uh, you know, people are not. It's not like you don't have this, and yeah. you choose to carry it with you and still run for president, and you get on the stage, and you write your books. I just think that that and is. Such you just touched on something that's going to make me cry again. <laughs> um, you said strong women, and, and that's something that I've heard a lot of people use to describe me, especially when I was going through my whole, you know, health ordeal. And they were like, but you're strong and you can do this. And, you know, I kept feeling, no, I'm not strong. It has nothing to do really with strength. But I think it had, and, and, and you know, I for all women out there and all humans out there, it, you don't have to be strong to be able to get through it. I think you just have to, you know, crave life, you know, come back to that, you know, that, you know, there's something out there that matters. And if that matters, then strength, you know, even if you're not feeling it, it will come by doing and acting and moving in the direction that you want your life to go. So um, I love yeah, I, that you're saying yeah. this because one of the things, so, you know, I teach and I, I work a lot with empowerment and, you know, empowering women. And one of the things that I teach is that strength is not a feeling. Like it's not, well, it can't be, you can't feel strong, but if we're waiting to feel strong before we give voice to what is important to us, before we write that book, before we run for president, before we get on a talk in front of the world in here with me, you know, we might wait a long time because surely when you were ill and when life hits you uh, still, you know, you don't feel strong, but, and you kept craving life and you kept getting out of bed and you kept doing what is important to you. And in my book, that is the definition of strength, Maria. That is why I'm calling you a strong woman because you are strong by the behaviors that you're doing and feeling the entire repertoire of shit <laughs> also, you know, horrible feelings. Yeah. And I should start calling you every time I feel down or, you know, Oh, how this self-doubt comes up. I'll start calling you, Ricky, to lift me up with all these kind words. I, I will, I, like, I'm going to say, I, I, I really, really mean this. So first of all, you know that you can. But also, and this is why I love working with perspective taking. This is why I asked about your mom as well. Because, you know, ha look, having somebody to look at you with kindness. And if I towards you or anybody who is listening to this, if I can make you feel strong 
by, you know, encouraging words that makes you get up and do the thing. Just know that you can always borrow my eyes or you can always borrow my, <laughs> you know, my perspective. You are, you can always take me with you, even if I'm literally not in the room with you or on the phone. Everybody, you, Maria, everybody watching this, you can always, I would be happy to be a vacacious empowerment, strength, hope, cheerleader for anybody as you are, Maria, to, to yeah, the people. I love this. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love this. Take my eyes with you. That, yes. That's wonderful. And, and I, I love this. And, you know, I, I when earlier, early in my career, when I started, uh, you know, practicing as a psychologist, I had a client who said, can I have a picture of you to keep in my wallet? And I thought, oh my God, that's scary. You know, somebody, you know, wants to have my picture. And, they, and they're like, well, I just want a reminder of all these things that you're teaching me. And, you know, this brought back this memory, what you've said. And I think that's so important, you know, and I, I love that, you know, you know, borrow my eyes and, yes. and look me through and, your eyes. And, and also, yeah. I, I love, you know, thinking about in our moments of where, where, where life is very painful and when we're beating ourselves up, remember that somebody out there is probably inspired by what we do like even so for everybody for everybody who's listening like you are all change makers and you 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 step into this world and you care about others and you want to help and i keep saying like if i could just touch the life of one person <laughs> you know it will all be worth yeah. it all the crying all the strength all the shit and you know everything pardon for swearing on air um and so <laughs> and i think this is so important to remember that life is all of that and strength comes from the way you you know keep getting up when life knocks you down the way you keep craving life so maria yeah. so and, and life is all that as you said ricky and a lot more yes life is a lot life is a lot and so so maria, just out of like so i'm guessing like many of us here uh, might be working with addiction and cravings as like as practitioners and i you know i keep saying there's no we and there's no them <laughs> we're all in this together so we're all having cravings and all having addictions my one of mine is sugar like i will crave i you know <laughs> give me sugar and i'm you know pretty happy and don't give me sugar and i'm pretty unhappy and it's just like it's just, it's just, it's not a struggle that you know keeps me from life but i can see that there's a, a pattern there that's not particularly uh helpful or healthy um i used to smoke that was also something i was a nicotinist i don't know if you say that like i if i <laughs> if i didn't get my cigarettes i would i was ready to murder somebody and so for 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 when you are at that place maria where one is craving something and where even we might you know uh start using something like start addicting something i don't know if you can say that but you know go into addiction mm -hmm. when you're at that place do you have like a like concrete tip because craving life as much as i love that it's just like here i am i want my sugar and i'm supposed to mm -hmm. like how does how do i crave life right now when all i want is pepsi max what, yeah. what would you say to me yeah. if I called you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and well, say, Help first me. I would say, take a breath. Yes. <laughs> take a few breaths. I, I do something called the pentadactylos breathing. The <gasps> One of the mountains in Cyprus is called pentadactylos, which means five fingers. Oh. So if everybody wants to try that with us yes. right now, let's yes. do the pentadactylos breathing. So breath in. Breath out, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And I like this because it gives you just a moment to be able to have this choice moment that we want to bring up. It's also because you're using your fingers, you can also see, so you're using your sight and you're also using your touch. So that helps ground you to the here and now. 
So it gives you just one second, just a few seconds to come back to this moment and to have a choice moment. So at that point, I would show you the choice moment and say, you know, do the breath, take a, these five breaths and slow down a little bit. Um, there's one um, acronym that I've stolen from Ras Harris, the STOP acronym, that S stands for slow down, T is for take note, notice what is happening right now, notice what your mind is telling you, notice what this craving is, that is just a craving, it's just words, it's just something your mind and your body have brought up. Next letter O is for open up. So can you at this moment make a little bit of room to have these feelings, these thoughts, and not act on them as they are, but come to the last letter P, pursue valued action. And now you choose what's more important to you. Where will it take you if you have this, you know, Coke or Pepsi or whatever, sugar? And, you know, is this where you want to go? And is this going to move your life forward? I love this. This is so hands on. I'm guessing that everybody like tomorrow will be out in the, you know, a, a clinic doing first work. I love this. Like, first of all, I love it just by the because of you know as you said it's like there's the touch there's the visual there's the slowing down um and i love that it has is named after those mountains it just brings a <laughs> you know it's it you're it's so beautiful where you're. it's yeah. such a personal touch but isn't that like that's completely hands hands down <laughs> that you stop and do this um and so tell us the acronym again is to to slow down take notes slow down Mm -hmm. open notes, up open up and pursue action pursue, pursue, pursue valued action pursue valued action mm -hmm. i love that that is so so concrete and that Thank is you so much. <laughs> and that is doable because sometimes i think that one of the things that i see in my own uh trainings is that you know we're all oh, there's Again, I love this craving life. And then sometimes it's like, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean literally when you are in that moment when life is difficult and you just gave us something really, really valuable? I love to the Hercules uh, metaphor, the, the story about Hercules. I think that is so beautiful. What What is like, what do you have like a favorite? Uh, so you just gave us a few metaphors. Do you have like that some a metaphor uh, regardless of what you're working with, is there a metaphor that's just like your favorite? Hmm, Which is the, I, said, I know it's a difficult question. Very what? difficult question because I have a number of favorites. Oh, I, um, I get. Let me rephrase. Of the <laughs> of your favorite, because I, I when people ask me what's your favorite song, I'm like I I, I can't because. But if <laughs> yeah. you ask me, like, could you tell me one of your favorite songs? I I would have a better answer what would yeah. be one of your favorite metaphors um yeah what i presented now but also maybe i think one that i i really like to use is one i've adapted from joan dahl a yeah. person i really admire and love um another strong woman uh you know that's really inspired me in my work um then and in that um, that's the metaphor the sky metaphor that we're like the sky and all of our thoughts and feelings are like the clouds and the stars and no matter what happens with the clouds and the stars you know no matter what the weather is like that we're always there and that we can connect to this vast huge sky and you know can again find ourselves that we're more than anything that we ever struggle with and that's a metaphor that I, I i like quite a lot and that's one that you know i use on myself as well that when i get lost in thoughts and you know doubt and 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 all these emotions and feelings that i remind myself who are you you're like the sky and you're you know, a lot more than anything you're struggling with at yes. this moment. You're like the sky, like carrying all of the weather, weather and, and, you know, being able to observe that. 
That is beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us, Maria. Like I could, I, I'm, I, you know, I want, I wish we lived closer. I wish, you know, no, everybody you. should have a Maria. Like you, we, we, we <laughs> yes. <laughs> or Ricky. I want to clone you and give you to the entire world. And I'm just so happy that you're here. And I want to ask the people who are watching us right now and see there's hearts and likes and love coming oh, our way and and there's uh, so many beautiful comments and i wanted to ask if there are any questions like if you wanted to ask maria something now that we're here um and so you know please put any questions that you have in your comments um Somebody says here, I'm just going to read some of the comments for you, Maria, as, as we are uh, seeing that if people have, there's somebody saying acceptance and compassion therapy, that <laughs> makes great sense. Somebody says that they are loving the Hercules metaphor. Uh, every moment is a choice moment. Oh, that, that's really, that is profound. Love this. Thank you. Many people are saying that it's a beautiful metaphor. And then, and again, there's a lot of hearts coming. Um, so here's one saying, feel so honored to know Dr. Maria Karekla, an inspiring mm -hmm. professor, an excellent clinician, a wonderful person, an amazing friend and true role model in everything she is and does, always admiring and looking up to her. Oh. Are you taking this in? Yes. <sighs> Who is it? How is it? And so the thing is that I can't see that right now, but I'm going to literally going to go into my phone and check out because the, the, the program that I'm using is disguising it so that people can be anonymous in their. Oh, this is um, Mariana. Uh, oh, Mariana yeah. Cherilao. I'm yes. not pronouncing oh, this correctly. Yes. <laughs> and so, and you hear my puppy is all, my puppy is very much in love with you as well. <laughs> Uh, so, may I ask how you deal with repeated relapse in a sense of act? I struggle at this point. So, repeated relapse. How do you deal with that? Yeah, uh, that that's unfortunately something we face a lot when when working with addictive behaviors, um, and um, I I do work with a lot of addictions, but especially with smoking. And I think smoking especially is one that has a lot of relapse associated with it. And I, I know, I, first of all, I, I remind myself of the stats uh, in terms of smoking. There's um, research to show that the average number of times somebody tries to quit smoking before they are successful is 17, one seven. Yes. So that should give us a little bit of a perspective in terms of how difficult that is and how many times people, you know, have to maybe ha go through before they are able to um, manage this or, or successfully uh, give it up. So to me, that gives a little bit of a perspective to remind myself that this is something that's that happens a lot. We're talking, especially when we're talking about addictive substances, you know, there's a reason why they're addictive. And it's if it was easy for somebody to give them up, they would give them up on their own. They wouldn't need us. So, and then I, I come to the person, remind them of this, and then each try gives us some lessons. Yeah. So we can see what have we learned from this approach so far you know what has worked what hasn't worked what happened at the moment the relapse occurred and what can we learn from that how can we manage that so that it doesn't happen again and then the next moment is again a choice moment where we can choose even if we relapsed before had a lapse before we're here now and if the person is there with us again that's really, really important because that means that they're there and again, able to try again. So I would use that again to, okay, compassionately accept what happened and then forgive ourselves, make some room that, you know, maybe that was one failed attempt and we can try again. And let's move forward, making a plan on what we wanna do in the next moment and the moment after that. 
I love that you're breaking this down into moments and, you know, having like compassion for the relapse. I think that is so beautiful. Thank you, Maria. Um, and so uh, another uh, beautiful person here is, is, apart from my dog, uh, somebody saying, will you repeat the name of the hand mountains? What is that called? Pendadactylos, which means five fingers. Five fingers. Yes. <laughs> and so when you do get lost, how do you ground yourself, especially with difficult emo emotions? How does one ground your yourself? I think maybe you answered it in this, right? It, that might be a grounding. Yeah. What else? Um, and also what we said before with the with the sky, I think, yeah, maybe the sky feels you're up in the air, but to me it also feels grounding because it gives you a perspective that yeah. you're more than anything you struggle with at this moment. So, and there's, there's a lot more and there's always more to life and more to, you know, what you can do. And maybe you're dealing with a difficult situation at this moment and this moment will also pass. And you know, even if you don't know what what the outcome of this struggle will be or how to solve it even, or maybe it's unsolvable, you know, that th there's still things that you can do. And, you know, even waiting or giving yourself a little bit of time or, you know, sometimes sleeping on it and, and you know, rethinking it the next day or, you know, making a choice even if you don't have the th feelings and thoughts that go along with making that choice and and that next behaving act so um i think that's what grounds me quite a bit yeah thank you Cor dr correctla somebody also says it's so helpful to know about the 17 times as you were referring to quitting smoking leads to much compassion for the process each try gives us some lessons i love that i love that that you're kind of turning this into a learning opportunity like it's a it's a as if it's a it's a journey that we're on right like quitting something or or rather i'm gonna i'm gonna say what you taught me at the very beginning craving life rather than giving into cravings of stuff uh is is all about you know in every moment choosing how you want to behave uh and you know going forward with cravings do you have any i'm noticing that i'm doing something that changes the size of you so if people are wondering what's happening with with your image it's me doing something that i don't know so before we end this, do you have any cravings uh, that you would be willing to, to share here? I share your craving, I guess, Ricky. I, I am also like loving sweets and I guess that's the one craving that I, when I have cravings, that's what shows up. Um, if you ask my husband, he'll say maybe I'm a workaholic and maybe that's my craving. But I, I, I would say sugar. Maybe it's more of like what I crave. And I think yeah. actually you're you're touching on something that is so important that you know most of it like there's there's uh, there are people who are really really suffering from this and you know. Every, regardless all of us knows cravings and most of us have has many of them don't we like it's just not one thing okay my my i'm craving my dog too <laughs> to <be a> little... <laughs> yeah. and so we're coming at the to the very end of this session and so i wanted to um again express my gratitude for you to to you like i i don't know if people know this but like you're donating an hour of your time uh, just to make a difference in this world. Like you are not asking for anything. Uh, you are here donating your time, donating your wisdom and, and you know, to, to inspire and to connect and to have impact in this world. And we're just, I'm personally so grateful that you are here. Um, and I've learned so much for you and I cannot wait to read your book. And I really do hope that your TED talk will be um, uh, 
tr- translate because uh, we don't know it yet. May but already it, is. I don't it know. Maybe it already is, but we don't know. So I just yeah. wanted to say, you know, on behalf of the people watching, like if you're watching right now, please send uh, the hearts and everything, uh, and uh, please put keep you know commenting in here because Maria and I we're in here and we're gonna check go through the comments and we're gonna you know connect with you in any way that we can for now I'm gonna ask you Maria to keep <laughs> to, to you know stay in the bar with me as we close the bar yeah. and we're gonna go offline and just you know uh, yeah again c- clean and close the bar in here and for the rest of you no matter when you're watching this please send the love so that we can uh, support uh, that we, yeah so we can support each other in in going in here with all our imposter syndrome and everything that comes with it so i i really appreciate you i love you so much and and thank you everybody for for being here and then uh, you know we'll we'll catch up later okay so bye guys (laughs)